Hello, I now own an Oculus Quest 2 VR headset and I'm still new at this stuff so I'm likely to be more positive than I would be if I was a VR veteran because honestly I'm just happy to be here and that's all the context you need to enjoy this video really. When we talk about VR titles, you don't see a lot of variety in what people talk about outside of very niche VR circles. I would bet if you never got into VR too much, you would assume Half-Life Alex and Boneworks are the only VR games in existence. And I couldn't blame you, because those are the biggest VR games around after all. But underneath the surface, there's actually a ton of cool VR games around. And even further underneath, you get Oculus exclusives, games that can only be played if you own an Oculus product and can only be bought in Zuckerberg's underground black market of VR known as the Oculus Store. And today's subject is one of them, a little known survival horror game called Lies Beneath. Now the very first thing I want to talk about this game is that, wow, the performance is really good. You can run it either directly on your Quest 2 or on your PC and I found no difference between them that I could notice. Both versions even go for a little under 2GB on your hard drive. This is definitely a well-optimized game. This also helps with capturing footage since some VR games can be very resource intensive and thus the footage quality usually takes a hit. But not here though, the performance you see on your screen right now is pretty much exactly how the game runs, which is buttery smooth. But enough about performance, technical stuff is boring, artful stuff is interesting. So let me tell you about what kind of art lies beneath this. That art being the Pulp Fiction comic books. Yes, the entire game looks like and it's framed like a comic book, down to having little sound effects popping up on screen when you do stuff. There is no voice acting, only comic books with cool 3D effects floating in the void for you to read and tough bubbles, well more like Todd Squares, where the protagonist shares her thoughts on what is happening around her as she tries to survive the sheer madness of what her hometown has become. Her name is May, by the way, and she is searching for her father after an unfortunate car accident sent them both spiraling out of the road and down a cliff. Right before he was about to tell her about the family heritage lighter she carries around to. Man, I just hate when my dad disappears right before he was about to reveal some plot critical information. But oh well, that leaves May alone in the freezing cold of Alaska, fighting for survival using only her lighter, her wits, and of course, a fucking gun! For you see, Lies Beneath is a horror game, but it's not a helpless horror game. It's more of an action horror game, much more like Resident Evil 4 than Resident Evil 1. But it's also very much a survival horror game, in that your inventory is limited and resource management is important. Though that is honestly kind of an understatement. Your inventory only has 3 slots one of which is permanently occupied by your lighter and the other usually by your gun, so actually you only have one extra slot for a melee weapon or a health recovering item, though you can always use one of your hands or both to carry some extra stuff as well. So yeah, it's extremely limited. Luckily, ammo doesn't occupy a slot and just requires you to reload your gun eventually whenever it runs empty with a simple motion. That's not to say you can just carry this stuff around and think it will be enough to survive for the game is actually very harsh with what little it gives you. If you just shoot every enemy, you will run out of ammo before important encounters, thus it encourages you to hide behind enemies and hit them while being stealthy, using an axe for extra damage, as well as to use environmental items like traps and gas canisters to kill multiple enemies in a single shot, thus saving some precious bullets. The single health item you can carry with you also can't bring you from near death to full health, so it's important to think if it might be to your benefit to spend bullets to get through the next encounter if you are low on health. Honestly, even though the game seems at first to give you very little room for decision with its limited inventory, it actually has more resource management decisions in it than the last four Resident Evil games combined. It has so much in fact that it can actually be a little too harsh, which is why I ended up flip flopping between easy and normal modes as I went through the game. The silver lining is that as you progress you can explore to find hidden lore items that unlock helpful items like extra ammo and food at each campfire, which usually resides at the start of each chapter, so things do get a little more manageable as it goes on, though the difficulty also naturally escalates, so you know, just a heads up in case you're thinking of picking this game up. As a side note, easy mode won't save you, as notably starting from the second major boss battle, the game gets a lot more frenetic and starts playing it a lot more dangerously. 
And speaking of boss battles, yeah, this game has just the right amount of them. There are major boss battles at the end of each chapter, and mini bosses are present as well. What amazes me is that, even with the limited degree of interactive elements, since this is a very inventory limited game that tries to only include VR intuitive controls, each boss battle still manages to call back to the different tools and interactions you are introduced to throughout the game as a gimmick in each battle, which makes them a classic definition boss battle by getting you to prove your skills in understanding the game's mechanics. It's just great all around. In terms of structure, the game also carries the Resident Evil 4 DNA and uses it to great effect. The game is very linear, with you going from A to B in a straightforward fashion, bearing a few side rooms that might net some goodies, but it does bring you back to places you've already been before, sometimes for story reasons, and sometimes with new tools that you can use to surpass previous obstacles. So while your journey is linear, the world you explore is a bit more nuanced than that. Also, there's an obligatory cabin shootout scene where you must lay traps and fight back against enemies while you are besieged, just like in Resident Evil 4, because at this point, might as well. Besides the big, easy to generalize stuff that every game has like gameplay or structure, what really piqued my interest are the little gimmicks that the game has, like cracking ice. The game takes place mostly around a quiet Alaskan town, and as such, frozen lakes are very common, but you can't just step all over them with no consequence, for if you take one step too many, the ice cracks and you instantly die. Instead, you must limit your time on top of them, running from safe ground to safe ground, while enemies can attack you from any direction. It's nerve-wracking when a nasty surprise suddenly pops up during these moments, and I really like that. I also really like the lighter. Yeah, sure, most of the game is pretty well illuminated, so you don't really have to use it to see most of the time. Instead, lighting it up causes the embers to fly in the direction of your next objective, in case you get lost. But it also highlights resources and interactable elements nearby. It can be used to light fires and lanterns to act as checkpoints, can burn demonic dolls during scripted arena sequences, and in perhaps one of the coolest things a video game lighter can do, if you hold it in one hand and a gun on the other hand, it will make an aim dot appear to show where the shot will land. It even auto-aims the gun on enemies and shows glowing red veins on each enemy's weak spot, which is not just very useful, but also hella cool, not gonna lie. I'm glad that instead of just insisting that the lighter is important in story, the developers also made it really useful in-game, while still keeping the interactions with it very intuitive. And speaking of story, the way it is presented in this game is kind of different. It's not like if there wasn't any other video games to try to use comic book conventions to try and tell a story, it's just that in this particular case, this is also a very interesting way to dodge some of the problems associated with VR storytelling. Namely, that you can't just throw a cutscene on screen like in traditional games without pulling the player out of the experience and putting them in a weird abstract theater place. And if you try to tell a story by forcing long scripted unskippable story sequences into the game, like say Half-Life, you can run the risk of ruining the game's replayability factor. So the developers cleverly decided to just use narration squares spread across the environment itself you can read them if you want to, or if you just want to skip ahead to the spooky gameplay, you can mostly ignore them. It's quite a clever way of doing it and saves some cost on voice acting, since comic books naturally don't have voice acting. As for the story itself, well, I don't want to spoil anything. Suffice it to say, this isn't a story that's very forthcoming with its details. But the ending is foreshadowed all the way from the very beginning of the game, and what might seem like mad rambling from the very few sequences of dialogue the game throws at you actually can hide a much deeper meaning when you look at it. The reason I don't think this is abstract bullshit and that there's actually a reason for everything is that if you know where to look at, the story is much simpler than how it first appears. It just likes to obfuscate the true nature of the events. Here's a hint if you need it though. Check the lore item descriptions in the main menu, things will make a lot more sense if you take the time to find all of the items too. So, if this game really is as amazing as I'm telling you it is, if the style, the gameplay and the story are all pretty good, how come it fell so deep under the radar? Well, we might never really know the truth. But if you want an uneducated guess, I'd say it's because ultimately Lies Beneath doesn't have any VR interactions that really pop at you. When you take a look at popular VR games that gather attention even among people that don't own VR headsets, it's stuff like Alex or Boneworks, stuff that really pushes the level of interaction that you can have with your environment. 
And while you can do some cool stuff like sticking your axe into wooden surfaces so you can pick it up later, it doesn't really have any eye-catching moments like stopping a headcrab from being there with a chair. Most of it is pretty traditional in terms of gameplay, which is not to say that it doesn't have mechanics and interactions that are only possible in VR that I found to be really, really cool. It's just that nothing in it pops at you the same way as the big titles. Hell, it doesn't even have crouch detection. So if you say you knock out the boards at the bottom of a doorway and you want to get under it, the game won't let you until you remove all of them because it isn't even detecting if you're crouching or not. It's that limited, unfortunately. There's also the fact that it is an Oculus exclusive. So if you got a PC VR headset, like a Vive or an Index, or God forbid a PS VR, then you're shit out of luck. Only Oculus headsets allowed here, buddy, which unfortunately limits its audience. But honestly, if the lack of wow factor is the biggest issue here, that's a shame, and I hope this review goes some way towards rectifying that, and that I can get at least one more person to try it out, because honestly, it's just a damn good game, and I really enjoyed it. And who knows, maybe if you take a look, you too can find out what is under there. No, wait, shit, I fucked up. God.